As soon as you are comfortable, I don't want to yeah. rush. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to uh, our discussion uh, this afternoon about uh, the upcoming uh, NATO summit. The president will be going there in a couple of days' time, so this is a very opportune moment to uh, be holding this uh, discussion. We've got uh, four very good panelists this afternoon. Kurt Volker, who's a former ambassador to NATO and a former uh, career foreign service officer. Uh, Alex uh, uh, Sandy uh, Vershbo, who uh, is also a former career uh, foreign service officer, was ambassador to uh, Russia. And, and NATO. And was a deputy secretary general of NATO, and I think I met him in Korea. You said mm -hmm. I, you strayed into the East Asia Bureau. Before. <laughs> um, Fun while it lasted. Right, and uh, <laughs> whose last job was as deputy secretary general, and then uh, of course Paul Sanders, who needs no introduction, and Doug Bando, who's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and it, and uh, just came from East Asia, as a matter of fact. He was in Shanghai yesterday, so. Uh, I'm sure he'll explain that to us. Uh, so each of the panelists will have an opportunity to talk for eight to ten minutes about the subject matter, and we're going to start with uh, Ambassador Volker. All right, thanks. Um, I think the first thing to start with is to say that I believe that the doubts that our European allies have had about the Trump administration's attitude toward NATO overall have largely been dispelled. Maybe I'd say we're in the 90% range at this point, as opposed to 75% a month ago and 40% two months ago. <laughs> and so I think the administration has been trying to climb back. Uh, what was the basis of those doubts? It was statements by uh, candidate Trump during the campaign that NATO was obsolete, that we would condition our fulfilling Article 5 collective defense commitments based on whether countries had paid their share and uh, a perception of uh, an embrace of Russia rather than an embrace of allies. Uh, but since becoming president, I think the administration, since he became president, the administration worked very hard to dispel that. Vice President Pence pulled the administration's policy together in time for the Munich Security Conference. You, had, you have now had a foreign minister's meeting with Secretary Tillerson, a defense minister's meeting with Secretary Mattis, You've had a couple of phone calls between the President and the Secretary General of NATO. You've had the Secretary General visit with President Trump at the White House. And you've had the President himself saying that NATO was no longer obsolete, uh, that NATO was a great organization. You have NATO countries spending more on defense and the trajectory is good. This started before he became President. There's no question about that. It started uh, every President for the last several has complained about NATO country defense spending. 2014 Wales Summit set a target of everybody getting to 2% by 2024. That was a nice target, but it had little credibility, and I think the credibility has now increased as countries have begun to actually increase. And even the finance minister of Germany, Wolfgang Schäuble, said that they can achieve that by 2024. And there seems to be real momentum. I'd say there's probably more countries if it's not all 28 that are, um, or 29 soon, uh, that are at 2% or on the way there, uh, it is closer to that statement than has ever been true for a long time, that they're either at 2%, say five countries, or increasing. Um, the other things uh, to say here are that um, in addition to complaining about defense spending, the president, uh, as a candidate, had also complained that NATO was focused on the wrong challenges, Russia, instead of the real ones, terrorism. Well, NATO has done more. Well, first of all, NATO has held on collective defense, Article 5, forward deployments, the reassurance initiative, all of those things have held. And in addition to that, uh, NATO has before the election, but also since then, focused on counterterrorism. And I would expect that at tomorrow's NATO summit, you'll see a very strong statement from NATO about uh, supporting or joining the coalition against ISIS and tasking further work by military authorities. They've also set up a coordination cell in uh, Naples, and you'll probably see more to come in uh, the counterterrorism area. 
there are a couple of things that um, are worth noting in the context. Uh, we went into this period of time, the last four months, uh, with the Brexit vote, uh, unclear pathway towards elections in France, and uh, questions over how the election was going to go in Germany. Since then, uh, the Brexit vote has resulted in a uh, snap election called by Theresa May, which is going to re return her in a resounding mandate in the UK. Macron has won in France, and Angela Merkel's election prospects have gone up considerably. So we're looking at a much stronger Europe going forward. And we're looking at the President having started to build relationships with some of those people, certainly with Theresa May and with Merkel, and soon with Macron when they meet at uh, the G7. What has not been done, uh, there has been a tentative decision, not publicly announced and articulated yet, about increasing U.S. troop presence in Afghanistan, which would be combined with an ask for allies on Afghanistan. But I don't think either the U.S. administration or NATO has clearly defined what our objective is in Afghanistan under this administration. I think it was left under the Obama administration as keep the Afghan government from falling, at least on our watch, and then we'll see what happens after that. In that respect, it was successful, but it's, it's not a way forward, and I don't think the Trump administration has come to grips with this either. I think there are significant doubts about whether a significant new U.S. investment in Afghanistan is worthwhile, but the consequences of not doing that are <laughs> that things could fall apart. Uh, similarly, there has not been anything new or clear on Ukraine. Uh, I think NATO um, had a, a minimalist posture on Ukraine under the previous administration. Nothing has changed with that so far in this administration. Uh, you have sanctions remaining in place. You have individual allies working to support Ukraine in various ways. Uh, the Minsk process is stuck, moribund, not going to produce a result, it seems, and there's nothing to replace it, and there's nothing that is changing the mix on the ground. Uh, so that's another area of, you know, yet to be tackled policy development. The other things that I would, um, I, I would bring up, so I, I always used to keep a checklist of what are the ways NATO adapted after the end of the Cold War. Um, Maintaining Article 5, well, I think it's in strong shape on that right now, thanks uh, largely to the Reassurance Initiative, uh, Phil Breedlove, the deployments in the East, uh, exercising and training. This has gone very, very well. So Article 5 is in good shape. Crisis management, less good shape. Uh, Libya was left a mess. Uh, no activity from NATO on Syria. Very reluctant in any kind of crisis management way to look at Ukraine. And as we said with Afghanistan, we're kind of um, – we're lacking a clear vision of what we're doing. Uh, enlargement, uh, Montenegro is coming in. That's a very good thing. I'm very pleased to see um, President Trump sign the paper, and, and that is moving forward. There is nothing new on the horizon, uh, and that is uh, an issue that I think both the U.S. and NATO as a whole need to grapple with. Do we hold out a vision of an enlarging NATO, or do we not do that? And uh, there, there has not been anything from the administration thus far on that. Uh, partnership, uh, we, uh, under the Obama administration, had a very strong partnership with a couple of countries, uh, Finland and Sweden in particular, uh, functioning as closely as you possibly can with NATO, and then a wider ring of partners that are uh, outside partners, uh, contributors to operations, people we will work with, but not a special relationship. And that's fine. That's probably about where it is going to be for a long time. NATO Russia uh, died. Um, it was revived. It died during the Bush administration. Uh, it was revived briefly by President Obama, but without uh, much to, to show for it, and died again after Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, frankly, I don't see any Russian interest in working with NATO. I haven't seen that since the mid 2000s. And uh, I'm, I'm not, therefore, holding out anything on NATO Russia cooperation at this point. And on capability development, the transformation of NATO capabilities, uh, it had been a transformation from heavy ground forces to deployable, mobile, sustainable forces, and then a, a long-term trend of declining resources going to defense. Uh, 
that is where we're picking up the story now and we're beginning to see increased resources come back into European defenses, but still not getting back to levels and capabilities that, that NATO really should have. Uh, so uh, final word, uh, the mechanics of a summit. Uh, it's going to be a meeting and a dinner. Uh, when President Bush was elected, he had a lunch and a meeting, or a meeting and a lunch. Uh, President Obama, his first meeting was the 60th anniversary summit, so it was already laid on as a much bigger affair before he was even elected. Uh, I think a meeting and a, and a meal is probably the best way to start. It's a good way for people to get to know each other. One of the problems that NATO has uh, perpetually had over time, uh, I don't know whether anyone will solve this, but having the, size, the number of countries that we have, let's now say it's 29, and the Secretary General, that's 30. If everybody takes up one issue and everybody speaks for five minutes, that is two and a half hours of discussion without there being any discussion. It's just going around the table once stating national positions. If you wanted to have three hours, that's already a seven and a half hour meeting. Uh, this is an untenable way for NATO to hold a meeting. And uh, what we need is more action-driven and decision-making or guiding discussions than the set-piece presentations by each country. Very hard to break NATO with a habit. I, I see my friend, the Portuguese ambassador here, and I can just imagine what Portugal would say if told that it can't have its five minutes. <laughs> so I respect that. But as an alliance, we, we've got to figure out a way to make this where we actually take best advantage of the time when we have heads of state and government together. I'm told that for this meeting it's going to be two minutes or two to three. We'll see how that works in reality, and we'll see whether the Secretary General is actually able to create discussion. It may be that it only happens over the meal. Uh, but uh, that's something I think we need to, to do a better job at with NATO and maybe Maybe President Trump is the one who will be able to make that happen. Uh, we need to be able to take best use of the time when we get senior leaders together. And I will pause there and look forward to the further discussion and the Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Kurt. Sandy? Well, thanks very much. It's, it's good to be here. Uh, Kurt was remarking as we were eating that we might be repeating ourselves, and I think there is a bit of risk of that. I'll try to cut, cut, cut the parts that overlap. but. Uh, I think for allies, uh, they came into the year 2017 feeling pretty good about uh, where NATO stood and what the kinds of changes they had all together uh, achieved in NATO, starting at the Whale Summit in 2014, but culminating in the Warsaw Summit last, uh, last year with the uh, steps to strengthen def deterrence and defense, the enhanced forward presence in the, in the four most exposed eastern countries, uh, enhanced presence or tailored presence in the south. Uh, they had turned the corner on defense spending, as Kurt said. Uh, 22 out of 28 countries had shown net increases during 2016. The overall spending increased by close to 4 percent. And I think equally importantly, they launched some important initiatives aimed at uh, what, what NATO calls projecting stability, uh, helping to stabilize the neighborhood, especially the Middle Eastern neighborhood, but also the, the Eastern Europe, the countries in between NATO and Russia. Uh, with uh, efforts to expand defense capacity building, to set up a whole hub for the south in Naples that would focus on uh, assessing threats uh, and pre preparing for crisis management missions if they became necessary. It was a joint declaration on NATO-EU cooperation, which uh, was quite a breakthrough in terms of uh, establishing a very broad agenda, uh, hybrid warfare, cyber defense, again, stabilizing the neighborhoods is something that NATO and the EU could best do together. Uh, I think allies felt more positive than Kurt did about the NATO-Russia dialogue, uh, not necessarily because we saw tremendous deliverables in, in sight, but it was an important uh, aspect of maintaining alliance cohesion. Um, having a two-track approach, defense on the one hand, dialogue on the other, has been very important for keeping uh, allies fully on board the decisions on defense and deterrence, uh, but also to maintain the balance between the southern challenges and the eastern challenges. So, so it may be excruciating to have these meetings with Ambassador Grushko in, uh, in Brussels, but uh, having that NATO-Russia dialogue has been helpful. So uh, once again, it was a demonstration of NATO's adaptability, uh, and I think also not highlighted as much at the time. Actually, 
European allies beginning to step up and take more responsibility with uh, three of the four uh, multinational battalions being led by UK, Germany, and Canada uh, with contributions from other European allies. Uh, so uh, burden sharing still uh, not uh, where it should be, but uh, at least the trends there were favorable. But then, of course, along came the U.S. election and the arrival of President Trump, and uh, allies suddenly realized that no good deed goes unpunished. And uh, Trump, of course, said NATO was obsolete. It wasn't uh, dealing with the most relevant challenges, namely terrorism, uh, that the U.S. was being taken advantage of. Uh, he made Article 5 conditional on allies fulfilling their financial obligations to the United States. Uh, and it looked, as Kurt said, that he was more interested in a reset with Russia than in uh, deepening the, uh, the transatlantic bond. Uh, and, and, and this was, I think, the first president who at least outwardly didn't seem to see any value in the European integration project or in uh, continued U.S. engagement in Europe. So everybody was pretty nervous. Um, but as Kurt said, so far the worst fears haven't been fulfilled. Allies have been reassured by the, the foreign policy team, by the speeches made in the debut appearances by the Vice President Mattis and Tillerson. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, the President himself came around when he saw Secretary General Stoltenberg and said that uh, it was obsolete, it's not obsolete anymore. Uh, and the administration has stuck to a uh, the, the con consensus approach on dealing with uh, Ukraine, maintaining the link between any sanctions relief and full implementation of the Minsk agreements. Uh, and its freedom of maneuver uh, has been at least narrowed uh, when it comes to Russia because of all the domestic uh, uh, investigations and faux pas. But I think allies, uh, I don't think they would put a 90 percent mark on uh, the, the reassurance thus far. I think there's still a lot of anxiety. Uh, potentially that the, uh, the conversion of the president uh, could be temporary, uh, that uh, he's still quite emphatic about uh, not putting up with free riders anymore. Uh, so I think there's at least uh, anxiety that this meeting could uh, lead to some new strains, and that's why allies, I think, have been working to try to make this uh, as prescripted an event as possible. Uh, and while I think it's likely that the outcome will be a positive uh, display of unity uh, and increased sharing of the burdens, uh, it will also have a pretty limited set of results and will leave a lot of questions unanswered, uh, not only about the U.S. commitment to NATO, but also about whether the allies are as committed to uh, making NATO effective uh, going forward. Uh, in particular, I think, uh, it's, it's not just a question of uh, the President reaffirming his commitment to the alliance and reassuring allies that he d really does stand by Article 5, uh, but it's also uh, for the Europeans and the Canadians uh, to demonstrate that they're prepared to do their part. Uh, and it's not just about spending, it's also about using NATO uh, more effectively to address the full array of challenges, uh, and in particular being more engaged in the Middle East. Uh, where allies continue to show a deep reluctance about giving NATO a more prominent role, even in, in the relatively safe uh, territory of, of defense capacity building. Uh, and they, and there's still the, uh, the jury is still out on whether allies are prepared to invest more in the kind of high-end capabilities that would give NATO uh, more effective crisis management capacity and warfighting capacity uh, over the longer term. Now, as far as the, uh, the summit itself, Kurtz described it a little bit. I think it's mainly going to be a dinner. Uh, there will be some ceremonies to uh, inaugurate the new billion-dollar headquarters, uh, which the opening of which has been delayed a little bit because of some IT problems, not because of construction delays. Uh, and uh, they're trying to uh, limit uh, interventions so that there's at least a chance for some spontaneity. But actually, I think uh, allies are mainly interested in hearing what prepared uh, statement President Trump uh, uh, has to deliver, uh, and they'll be parsing that uh, statement extremely uh, carefully. Uh, but allies agreed very quickly with the Secretary General's uh, suggestion that, that the focus of the summit be on the twin complaints advanced by President Trump uh, on, on burden sharing 
and on NATO doing more on terrorism. Uh, and I think on spending, uh, Trump has had some effect in putting the fear of God in allies. I think uh, while the trends were already moving in the right direction, thanks to uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, I think he squeezed a little bit more blood out of the stone in the last uh, few months so that allies are likely to agree to, us, to pr present by the end of the year uh, investment plans which will show how and how quickly they will meet the 2 percent goal. And uh, I think we're going to see that three more countries join the 2 percent club next year. Uh, and I think at least as far as uh, the Chancellor Merkel and uh, Schäuble are concerned, Germany is the most significant country to, uh, to pledge uh, to move up from its now current 1.2 percent to, to, to meet the 2 percent uh, target. So who are the three? The three that will join the club are uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Romania. But, uh, but Germany, I think, will be on, uh, on the right trajectory, although the SPD continues to openly dissent, uh, arguing that uh, you should subtract what uh, the UK and France uh, pay for nuclear weapons, since Germany is not a nuclear power, and that they should therefore pay about two-thirds of, uh, of what a 2 percent budget would represent. But uh, I think what, what NATO also needs to do, this may not happen uh, at the summit or, or anytime soon, is establish a much more rigorous enforcement mechanism, because right now these commitments are largely uh, aspirational, and uh, the, the, the NATO defense planning process doesn't really provide for effective enforcement of these sorts of commitments. Now, I think in return for uh, the, the progress on defense spending, al allies will be looking for an unequivocal, un unconditional uh, reaffirmation of Article 5 by President Trump, uh, but also a reaffirmation of the commitment to maintain, maintaining a robust U.S. presence in Europe, both its, the U.S. contribution to the NATO forward presence, which is in Poland, uh, but also the additional uh, armored brigade combat team that is being provided on a, and will rotate around Europe uh, under the uh, European Deterrence Initiative. Uh, hopefully the administration will also indicate a readiness to put the, the EDI into the regular defense budget rather than having it uh, subject to the vagaries of politics by being lodged in the uh, over, overseas contingency operations budget. Uh, I think allies will be listening very carefully to what the president has to say about Russia and Ukraine um, and hoping that he'll continue to, to, to reflect the uh, consensus that uh, was established at the Warsaw Summit uh, about defense and dialogue and balance, uh, maintaining the sanctions on Ukraine uh, until uh, Minsk is implemented. Uh, now, when it comes to the fight against terrorism, uh, here it's a bit less clear whether anything much new is going to come out of uh, the meeting uh, on Thursday. Uh, there may be some symbolic steps, such as NATO formally joining the counter-ISIS uh, coalition, but it's not clear that it'll have any operational impact. Uh, NATO may agree to provide another AWACS plane or two to provide surveillance in support of the coalition. Uh, the, there may be a new intelligence hub to go with the hub for the south in Naples, uh, but again, this uh, may be more symbolic than changing patterns of intelligence sharing within the alliance. I think where uh, allies should be going further but seem very reluctant is to, to ex substantially expand capacity building programs for partners like Iraq, Libya, Jordan, Morocco, countries that could, could benefit from much more significant uh, NATO support in training their forces and in supporting uh, defense reforms. Uh, but allies are very ambivalent still about NATO being involved in the Middle East at all, claiming that NATO has, the, has a crusader image that should be avoided. And they're very uh, reluctant to commit uh, significant uh, new funds for capacity building programs, uh, despite the strategic rationale. So your past 10 minutes. Sandy, okay. Is there okay. A point yeah. Like to be so, uh, this is something which I think will be uh, unfinished business uh, beyond Thursday's meeting. And I think the Trump administration has to make up its mind whether it wants to push NATO uh, to do more in the Middle East or not. There's, there's well-established divisions even within the U.S. government with the CENTCOM tending to favor coalitions of the willing, UCOM tending to favor doing things through NATO. Uh, so that's something that uh, will have to be addressed down the road. And there's a lot of other issues relating to defense modernization which uh, 
are not likely to be touched on cyber defense, anti-access area denial, maritime security, uh, NATO's role in countering disinformation and, and other aspects of hybrid warfare. Uh, here the administration I think is still uh, work, uh, you know, following the lead of the, of the previous administration but hasn't put its own imprint on how NATO should address these issues. Uh, I've put forward some suggestions with my former colleague Fabrice Poitier in a, in a paper that came out today, NATO and Trump, which is available out of the table, so I won't go into those now. Uh, but I think there's still a lot of uh, work to be done if NATO is going to be uh, seen by the U.S. administration as, a, as indispensable as it has been seen in, in previous years. And a lot depends on whether the Europeans are prepared to overcome some of their reluctance about using NATO more effectively, uh, militarily and politically. Um, without a U.S. push, I think you'll see uh, inertia uh, becoming the default setting for the Allies. And uh, I think that would be a missed opportunity for the new administration, which uh, could, uh, despite uh, the fears at the beginning of the administration, become the catalyst for another important step change in NATO's uh, transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul? Thank you. Thank you. So I, I'm going to focus on Russia. Uh, and uh, the NATO relationship with Russia and some of the uh, dilemmas uh, that, that we have uh, in dealing with Russia uh, as Americans and as part of an alliance. Uh, Russia is not really expected to be uh, kind of an organizing principle of uh, this summit, which is, is focusing more on uh, burden sharing and on counterterrorism, at least according uh, to what I've seen. Uh, but at the same time, you know, Russia uh, clearly is a, a leading security challenge uh, for, for many NATO members, especially as you move uh, further north and, uh, and further east. Uh, that, that's where the countries are who really view uh, Russia as uh, a greater threat. Uh, uh, of course, there's an ongoing conflict uh, in eastern Ukraine where Russia has been involved. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, we have uh, President Trump uh, continuing to signal uh, his openness to having uh, some kind of a different uh, and presumably better uh, U.S. Uh, relationship with Russia. So when you combine uh, those three things, I mean, the, the Ukraine conflict, this wider uh, threat perception, and uh, Trump's expressed interest in a better relationship, uh, together with all of the excitement inside the Beltway uh, surrounding these various different uh, investigations, uh, I think Russia is going to be a very important subtext uh, of, of much of the discussion. Uh, at, at the meeting, and I think we've heard already from the previous two uh, speakers some of the ways that that might happen. Uh, I think the fundamental NATO-Russia problem uh, is that Russia is not satisfied with the, the European security architecture that grew out of the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the collapse uh, before that uh, of the Warsaw Pact. And uh, uh, Russia uh, clearly wants to have a, a much greater voice in European security matters. Uh, the United States and European governments have been uh, resistant to that. Uh, uh, all of us together, I mean NATO and Russia, have not yet found a mutually satisfactory uh, answer to that problem. And uh, this produces, I think, most uh, of the tension uh, that exists uh, still today between NATO and Russia. Now, as a practical matter, you know, the United States and its NATO allies are considerably more powerful than Russia. So as our policy has unfolded over the last two decades, we have mostly been able to define European security uh, uh, in the way that we wanted, I mean, in line with our preferences. Institutionally, by uh, expanding NATO and, and defining its role uh, in military terms through decisions to use force, for example, in Yug Yugoslavia, uh, despite uh, Russian preferences to the contrary. 
uh, Russia, for its part, recognizes its own weakness relative to the United States and NATO uh, and is constantly looking for different asymmetrical responses uh, to NATO and American power. Energy leverage, weak neighbors, you know, there, there are a variety uh, of other uh, uh, ways that Russia does that. Uh, and uh, uh, as a longer term problem, if we don't reach some kind of mutually satisfactory understanding between NATO and Russia, I think we have to expect that this uh, competition with all of its various destructive uh, consequences is going to continue uh, indefinitely. Uh, we, uh, and uh, from my point of view, at least, uh, it will be uh, a significant uh, distraction from uh, the ability of the United States to deal with some other serious problems, uh, including managing China's rise and, uh, and dealing with the terrorism uh, problem. Uh, nevertheless, you know, we have the, the situation that we have, and uh, I, I think it will be uh, extremely difficult to formulate any kind of uh, different NATO-Russia uh, relationship so long as we have the, the conflict in eastern Ukraine uh, unresolved. Uh, it, it creates a whole variety of uh, political and uh, security and other uh, obstacles to any kind of uh, broader effort. Uh, to deal with this uh, problem that we have. Uh, the Trump administration, I would completely agree with the previous speakers, I think so far has basically continued the approach that the Obama administration uh, had uh, to that issue and uh, uh, does not seem yet to have formulated any new uh, ideas uh, about how to deal with that problem. Uh, for, uh, for its part, I'd say Russia has been exercising relative restraint uh, over the period of the last uh, few months in that situation. I expect uh, in part because President Putin and other leaders in Moscow are still trying themselves to figure out what to expect uh, from the, the Trump administration and are trying to uh, avoid uh, taking any steps that could preclude uh, developing uh, a better relationship. Uh, that being said, uh, I, I think if uh, President Putin and others in Moscow develop a strong sense that it won't be possible for whatever reason uh, to have a better relationship with the United States, you know, I, that, that may be uh, reflected uh, in uh, some of their choices uh, moving forward in Ukraine. And I think we, we could see uh, a, a different Russian approach. There will still be constraints, I think, on Russian conduct in Ukraine for a variety of reasons, uh, not least of which uh, Russia is uh, a little bit trapped in a situation in which uh, uh, it's not possible, uh, at least at this point, to find a face-saving settlement that ends the, the conflict. Uh, it is not desirable to uh, uh, annex the separatist-controlled uh, territories. Uh, and it's also not desirable to uh, uh, escalate in a way that would allow Russia and the separatists to settle this dispute on their terms. So absent that, uh, Russia and uh, actually the rest of us, I think, are uh, trapped in this kind of no war, no peace uh, situation uh, in, uh, in, in eastern Ukraine. Um, now, uh, looking ahead, uh, I think this leads to several important questions that I hope will come up. 
uh, in, in discussion uh, at the summit. And it's kind of disturbing to think that we would get uh, 28 heads of state and the Secretary General of NATO together uh, for a day and they would have uh, so little time actually for a, a serious exchange of opinions. Uh, well, but, they, but just an interjection. Yeah. They won't be the only people. No, there. of course, of course. <laughs> you're, 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 you're quite right. You're quite right. They're ventriloquists. No, <laughs> no, no, no. A absolutely. <laughs> Obviously, there are a lot of other things happening at the same time. Uh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, but I, I think there are uh, some important and fundamental questions uh, that I hope uh, our uh, NATO heads of state uh, will be thinking about. Uh, is a settlement in Ukraine preferable to the current status quo? And on one hand, uh, you would think that the answer is kind of obviously yes, but on the other hand, uh, you know, there hasn't been uh, a, a settlement, and that's clearly because it requires uh, most of the parties to do things that they don't want to do uh, in, in order to get a settlement. So I think that's, that's uh, an important question. How important is it to get a settlement? What are all of the parties willing to do uh, in order to reach uh, a settlement? Uh, if it's desirable to reach a settlement and we're willing to take uh, steps that we think are necessary to get a settlement, how do we envision that process uh, in practice uh, working out? Uh, the, the Minsk agreement, I, I would certainly agree, it, it seems like it's stalled. Uh, is there uh, another approach? Uh, is there a way to make that approach uh, work more effectively? Uh, my own view is that that agreement was never really sufficiently specific, actually, to be uh, implementable. Uh, and maybe it could work if uh, uh, there were another uh, round of discussion to try to make it more specific. Perhaps it wouldn't. Perhaps we need a different approach. Uh, that, I think, uh, is a question to ask. Uh, is greater U.S. involvement in that process helpful or not? Uh, that, that's another interesting question that I, I hope would be discussed. Uh, and, and finally, you know, with the Russian presidential election now, uh, uh, I think about nine months uh, away, or perhaps ten months away, in uh, uh, early 2018, uh, how will Vladimir Putin respond uh, to, or how is he likely to respond uh, to uh, uh, different types of U.S. efforts to resolve? Uh, or NATO efforts to resolve the conflict in eastern Ukraine? Uh, how, how is he likely to respond to efforts at additional pressure? Uh, how is he likely to respond to uh, a, a more conciliatory uh, approach? Uh, I, I think that's something else we have to think about. So these are very broad questions, uh, uh, I, I, and I'll, I'll leave it there as uh, perhaps food for thought. <laughs> Doug. Well, it's a pleasure to join you know, the panel here. The center has always been you know, quite open and kind of discussing some of these issues and broadening uh, the discussions, and I think that's certainly worthwhile to do in terms of NATO at this point in time. I think we have to recognize there's a backdrop to the NATO discussion that goes well beyond Europe. The first is to recognize America's financial condition, which in my view the U.S. is functionally bankrupt. I mean, un unfunded liabilities total about $200 trillion. The uh, con Congressional Budget Office tells us that within a decade, absent responsible change on Capitol Hill, which I'm not holding my breath for, we will have trillion dollar deficits without a financial crisis, which is the last time we had trillion dollar deficits. And the numbers grow worse after that as the baby boomers continue to retire. Indeed, the numbers uh, you know, grow extraordinarily bad. Even at the current point, domestic discretionary spending, which Congress always wants to cut to fund other programs, accounts for about 15% of the U.S. budget. So the question is, if you want to expand U.S. military commitments and maintain a large force structure, where will the money come from? 
well, don't go to assisted living homes and suggest we cut Medicare and Social Security to fund that. Good luck cutting Medicaid. That's being expanded, not cut. And interest, uh, interest payments will, are going to be going up as the Federal Reserve backs away from its zero interest rate policy. Those are the big spending areas as long, <clears throat> along with defense spending. So any foreign policy, any military commitments have to be conducted within that context. I think that's going to have an increasingly important role in the coming years. And the second is every area on the globe seems to demand America's attention. Uh, I did just return from Shanghai. I was there for a maritime conference. And the uh, Chinese interlocutors with whom I dealt are not particularly interested in seeing China back away from its aggressive stance in the South China Sea, in the Sea of Japan, and elsewhere. This is a challenge that's going to continue. The uh, you know, Trump administration, of course, has made North Korea a very high priority. And the president right now is not in Europe. He's going to Europe, but right now he's busy in the Middle East, where the U.S. is at war, and we are talking about a NATO for the Gulf states, yet another set of commitments for yet another set of rather weak you know, potential allies. And then it's on to Europe. So I think the backdrop is America is very busy in the world, and America doesn't have a lot of extra money to throw around. I think the question of what to do with NATO requires stepping back a bit. The president, uh, to his credit, in my view, has been critical of NATO. I think his criticisms have tended to be rather misdirected. You know, the issue of terrorism, I don't see a military alliance as being the best mechanism for dealing with terrorism. There are a lot of issues there, and there are areas of cooperation, but it doesn't strike me as being the best uh, structure for that purpose. And the issue of burden sharing, while entirely le legitimate, of course, gets us off into the swamp of what numbers are right, who makes what calculations. I mean, Britain and Poland are above 2%, but there's some question about how much of that is due to a statistical ledger domain. The, uh, you know, Greece is above it in part because of Turkey. I mean, the whole question about who rises above and below, I think, is a challenge. And I, if you look at European spending, I think it's very hard to believe that many European countries take a threat of Russia seriously. I mean, the fact that, you know, it will not be until next year when we hope Lithuania and Latvia may be above 2% is striking given the fact they are countries viewed as most at risk that one would have thought that if they had seen themselves as likely victims of Russian aggression, they would have done more and done it more quickly. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll see where the Germans go. I have to say that while I recognize the promise that's been made by Ms. Merkel, I'm very skeptical that Germany is going to effectively double military spending by 2024, even if we end up this year with an FDP, CDU, CSU coalition, as opposed to a grand coalition. And if it's a grand coalition, I don't see how that works, since the SPD has been quite clear that it's not interested in meeting the goal. Germany spent 1.19% of GDP on military last year. It's up to 1.22% this year. Imagine over the next seven years, are we going to get the kind of acceleration of spending to give us 2%? I am profoundly skeptical. And throw in countries like Spain and Portugal and Italy, I really don't see these countries markedly increasing military spending, whatever commitments have been made at a NATO forum. So these issues, I think, are going to leave us with this very unproductive debate, what's the percentage, should foreign aid be counted, do nuclear expenses count, et cetera. The real challenge here is I think the Europeans have a different sense of the threats and the different sense of the remedies than American policymakers today. And that makes it much tougher in terms of the orientation of the alliance. The issue really isn't what people say, it's what they do. And I just don't see any activity on the part of the Europeans to suggest they view Russia as a serious threat. And certainly <clears throat> the uh, Europeans, at least not Poland and the Baltic states, the others seem to have a very different conception here. I'm not aware of anyone that I've come across, at least in Germany and elsewhere, who imagined a re-engineered Red Army marching towards the Atlantic. They have a very different conception then of the military that should be created. And the question then is, should we spend a lot of effort badgering them, pushing them, demanding that they create the military in our image as opposed to the military forces that they seem to view as appropriate for their own continent? You know, we get into extraordinarily acrimonious debates, but the reality is the governments of Europe, and especially the peoples of Europe, don't seem to see the need to spend the kind of money that people in Washington want spent.
And I just don't see that changing. And I doubt it will change dramatically in France, despite Mr. Macron's victory. And as I said, I don't think it's going to change dramatically in Germany, even if Ms. Merkel you know, wins. <clears throat> And I think a part of this problem is, you know, the reality is, while the Europeans may want us to defend them, they don't need us to defend them. To me, what is striking is how different the world looks today than when NATO was created, yet the presumption that NATO must be preserved more or less as it has always been. That is, if you look at uh, combined GDP and population, Europe, of course, is not only well ahead of Russia, it's ahead of the United States. The question is, even today, the Europeans spend more on the military, dramatically more on the military than the Russians. Now they have problems of interoperability and other issues. Nevertheless, clearly the resources are there, the ability is there, the question is the willingness. <clears throat> I think we need to raise the question as to whether it makes sense for the U.S. to have the dominant role in NATO and dominant role in European defense today that it has always had since I think the threat is dramatically different and the Europeans have the capability of dealing with whatever threat they perceive. Whether it be the European Union or NATO with the U.S. as an associate member or some other kind of forum, one could imagine a different defense architecture that uh, would be a very good test, actually, of the relevance of the European Union. You know, whether what we see today is a revival of commitment to the European Union or merely kind of an intermission before new crises come in, whether it be yet another economic crisis in Greece or whatever else, elections in Italy or other things that may come down you know, the pike. It strikes me that there's very good reason for a cooperative relationship across the Atlantic, one that frankly foregoes dubious military interventions such as Libya and Afghanistan, both of which strike me as not being particularly useful for NATO or for the United States. Sixteen years of nation building in Afghanistan, I would argue, has been a disaster. Libya has turned out to be rather tragic compared to what we certainly wanted. There is an essential role that the U.S. can play, but that strikes me as much more backup as opposed to being expected every time somebody in Europe is worried to send yet another <clears throat> you know, group of American soldiers. The question is why should the U.S. be the country that is expected to put yet more troops in, whether it be Poland or the Baltic states or elsewhere, when in fact Europe is manpower rich, and I might note Europe is not involved in the same number of wars overseas as the United States. Europe is not defending South Korea. Europe is not, Europe is not defending Japan. Europe is not expected to take on the Chinese on maritime issues. You know, again, the United States is very busy and has an extraordinary number of commitments, as well as a financial future that is, I think, quite challenging and indeed much worse, frankly, than the Europeans. The Europeans don't have the unfunded liabilities that the United States has, and I've seen no recognition or no willingness in the U.S. Congress or the current administration to take on the serious budget issues you know, that we face. I mean, NATO played an essential and a critical role during the Cold War, and it succeeded. It created a shield behind which American allies, European allies, developed, got through, the, you know, re kind of recovered from the war, created a political infrastructure to hold themselves together, and seem to finally put aside centuries of internecine conflict. Now it's time for the United States to benefit from their success, which be, would be to step back and expect them to take over a much greater role in defending themselves. And if they do perceive a great threat from Russia, they should be behaving very differently. And it's pretty obvious they will not do so so long as they believe they can rely on the United States, which is perfectly rational behavior but it's not uh, good or useful behavior for the United States, especially at this point in time, given America's obligations elsewhere around the globe, as well as its economic problems that are coming down the pike. I'll stop there. These are very interesting observations. I can't, rem can't help but remember that at various times in the past when we've had raised that very question whether we ought to leave it more to the Europeans to do it for themselves. I always wondered whether we were psychologically and constitutionally capable of letting the Europeans do it for themselves, but that's just a personal question that I have. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to open it up to discussion and questions. If I could just ask the first one. The 28 members in NATO, uh, 20 years from now, how many members will NATO have? Any of you want to discuss this question of NATO? How many years? Uh, 20 years. Oh, yeah. Far enough out so that 
we probably won't be able to hold any of us here accountable for <laughs> <laughs> probably 30. I think they might take in one one or two more from the Western Balkans, but I'm sure I have a feeling it's not going to go any farther than that. Macedonia might be the next one, and that might if we can solve the yeah, satisfy yeah. the Greeks. Or the yeah. Yeah. Um, I thank you. Um, well, one, two, three, four, five, between five and seven more, so well, thirty-three to thirty-five. Finland, Sweden. I hope you're right. Finland, Sweden, <laughs> Macedonia, Kosovo, Serbia. Then we'll see about uh, others. Mm -hmm. It all depends on what happens in Russia in 28. Okay, let's open it up. You're banking on 28, I guess, Doug. Well, it's going to be 29. 29 by the weekend. It's going to be 29. 29, <laughs> <gonna> be 29. <laughs> 29 sorry. <laughs> well, I, I meant minus one. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, uh, just Tell us who you are. Uh, David Drummond, I'm the defense director for the national interest. Uh, just a question about, you were talking about um, the slowing down of the expansion process, that being a potential problem. Uh, why is that a problem, and uh, what benefit does the United States gain from having additional, you know, like members join, and essentially, from what I can tell, an additional liability for this country to uh, defend? So, uh, the way I think of this, and I think it's important to take a moment to just set it out. Uh, the United States, being a democracy, a market economy, a trading country, a country that needs its own security also needs to live in a world where those values are respected and increasing. That it is, if we're alone in the world, everybody else is uh, dictatorship, mercantilist, uh, statist, and threatening, and that's a bad world for us. Uh, we benefit from having a stable and secure and democratic and prosperous Western Europe. Benefit from having that in Latin America. We, we benefit from that with Japan. Um, there are plenty of other countries, uh, whether in, um, in the Balkans or in Eastern Europe, even Russia itself, if it were to change, uh, plenty of other countries where people are not seeing those values realized in their own societies. They aspire to them. And it would be better for the people there, but also better for the United States for that to be the environment we're living in. And NATO enlargement has been one of the tools that we've seen over the years that both inspires countries to the right reforms. And these countries are also contributors to collective defense, both militarily but also geographically contributors, that they create a, a secure space. We don't think about having to defend Germany today. Uh, we did have to think about that a lot before. We don't think about having to defend Italy. We used to have to think about that. Uh, now we're, we're thinking about, well, uh, what about uh, Poland or Romania or the Baltic states. And quite frankly, I think we're going to be best off in a world where we see that expansion of those elements, democracy, prosperity, and security. That's what NATO enlargement underpins. Uh, now, that's not to say that you get there overnight. And in fact, the process that we've taken to get to where we are now with 28 members of NATO has taken a long time. It took a lot of reforms on the part of countries that joined. Some of them have had some backsliding, and there's still work to be done. Uh, but we are fundamentally better off as a result, and I continue to believe that we will be better off the more that trend continues. I guess this is time for all the national interest editors to ask questions. I'm Jacob Heilbrunn, editor of the National Interest. And both Kurt and Doug's comments prompt me to uh, muse about the status of the United States in Europe. And Kurt and I were at this uh, symposium at the German Foreign Ministry last week. And I served as the moderator, and he was one of the speakers. And I don't want to rehash what we discussed. But uh, when we talk about the United States and the, and the democratic values that you talked about, Kurt, uh, which were a high point during the Cold War, but we're not in the Cold War anymore. We have The Economist magazine downgrading the United States as a functioning democracy. Uh, we have, I think there's a new study out showing the American healthcare system is like 
halfway down the rung of countries around the world. So my question is, uh, how much clout does this American democratic model still carry in Europe? And to press the point even a little further, when you talk to, when I, some of the Europeans I talked to said, the United States is really the problem. It has an insurgent president. Russia, on the other hand, has an establishment president. He's been in power for a long time. He's not a revolutionary leader anymore. So from the European perspective, is it in fact the United States that looks like the more uncertain, unpredictable power than even Russia at this point? So do we want to let somebody else sure. take a shot at that? No. The first yeah. It does strike me there's a different character to the relationships. That is, certainly the Europeans, not just Europeans, virtually anyone overseas I run into. I was in Seoul two weeks ago and they asked me to explain our president and his policy and it's very hard to do so. But I don't think that while the Europeans may view the U.S. as being an uncertain and unpredictable ally, I don't think they view it as a threat. I think that Mr. Putin, certainly nobody there views him particularly favorably. While they may not view him as being necessarily a dangerous threat, they certainly don't view him as being helpful in a way they hope the U.S. would be helpful. So I think it's more a question of dashed expectations or hopes in terms of the positive that they don't think they're going to get from Donald Trump, as opposed to fear of the negative consequences. And I'm not sure if his uh, policy on NATO is over, and I think that may be an undercurrent to this debate. This is a man who, as far as I can tell, changes his, his tune whenever he feels like it. the zeitgeist hits or something, and we have a new statement. And of course, his aides rush out to assure us none of that actually matters, but he does remain the man in the Oval Office. And we saw that, again, with South Korea, where he said he was uh, right in the midst of their presidential election that he wanted to tear up the FTA and charge them a billion dollars for the THAAD missile deployment. H.R. McMaster went out and said, kind of in the scene of the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, it was it doesn't matter what he said. Now that, I doubt Donald Trump's going to take terribly well in the coming months and years. So I do think that Europe, we, the Europeans may be right to fear that they have yet to have a stable policy. But I, I think that there's a difference in how they perceive Russia and the U.S. as threats or as you know, potential benefits. Sandy. Yeah, I, uh, yes, the Europeans see Trump as an insurgent or a disruptive leader. And I think uh, where that worries Europeans is because they see a widening gap in terms of basic values commitment to uh, freedom, justice, rule of law. They see increasing differences on specific policies, whether it's climate change or, uh, or you know, how society should be ordered. Uh, and I think that they uh, fear that the U.S. is squandering its ability to lead in Europe and in the world. And I think they, that's worrisome to them because Putin, while he may be establishment in the sense he's been around a long time, he, he is definitely an anti-status quo leader who's used force to change borders in Ukraine, continues to occupy other uh, territories of other neighbors, uh, and uh, as Paul said, is, is basically rejecting rules-based order that we thought had been kind of consolidated over the last 20 years. And I think they, they don't have the confidence or the capacity or the unity to confront that on, themselves, on their own. And I think they, they, they want to work with the U.S. to try to rebuild that rules-based order, uh, but they're, I think, still in doubt no matter what positive outcome comes out of this week's meeting, that they're still in doubt that the U.S. is, is, the, is the leader that can get them there uh, the way it was uh, for the previous decades. Question. Hi, my, <clears throat> Hi, my name is Andrew Hanna. I'm with Politico. Um, so it was said that the NATO summit that's coming up this week is going to be pretty much a, a meeting and some kind of meal, lunch or dinner. Um, so what can the administration do to actually set things in motion for the next time that they meet up to have some kind of new direction or change in policy that they want? And what can the president do at this summit to set those things into motion? Well, this, uh, you know, summits are usually kind of culminations of periods of work, but this one is a little different. It's more, it is more a get acquainted event for a new U.S. president 
uh, and an opportunity to kind of ensure that we're still on the same page. But I think it's the next summit, whether it's next year or in the 70th anniversary year, 2019, when uh, sort of the next major decision point would come. And uh, you know, the administration needs to set the agenda for that. And I'm not sure it's going to happen this week, but I think between now and you know, when Secretary Mattis has his next meeting with his counterparts in, uh, in June or in October, one of those meetings, and Tillerson as well. U.S. has to start making up its mind what it wants NATO to look like going forward. Does it want a more, more minimalist role? Maybe they'll conclude, as Doug does, that maybe NATO isn't the right institution to, to, to do certain things. Uh, I would agree that you know the actual military role in fighting terrorism may be best left to a coalition of the willing. Uh, I still believe that NATO could do a lot more in, in sort of the preventive side, uh, capacity building, but the administration has to make up its mind what, what it wants NATO to do. Does it have a high level of ambition, or does it want to just kind of be a, uh, have a more steady state evolution of NATO? But uh, a lot of the, the work going forward is, is, is was set by the summit last year, and so there'll be a certain amount of uh, uh, just doing your homework, delivering additional capabilities to uh, you know, make this det enhanced deterrence posture real, you know, more air lift, more uh, electronic warfare, more precision strike, all these different capabilities so that you actually have a more credible deterrent. Uh, but there, too, the administration is going to have to constantly be you know, cracking the whip. Uh, NATO doesn't function without a strong U.S. leadership and a strong sense of direction from the administration. So maybe, maybe, maybe 2019 is the best target uh, since it's the anniversary year. It'll give the administration time to actually maybe staff up the State Department and the Pentagon. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe by 2019 there will be Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. Yeah, we're going to have driverless departments. <laughs> That's right. Um, the, uh, can I just inject a follow-up uh, to that? Mm -hmm. I mean, the President's just coming off of a trip uh, to the Middle East, which I would have thought would be a little bit front of mind for him. So. Can't, couldn't we expect something to come out on the Middle East uh, as a consequence of his trip? He's going to have some ideas and, and yeah. fresh impressions. Yeah, well, for example, this uh, Gulf NATO that he was yeah. pushing, which is not a brand new idea, uh, if that's going to actually ever get any sort of traction and, and become a functioning entity, they need to work with NATO. They, they have tried and failed many times to integrate their forces, set up unified command, combine their you know, air and missile defenses. Uh, it's basically gone nowhere. So maybe hiring NATO as their, their mentor, trainer, uh, designer of their, of their, their structures uh, would make a difference. So maybe Trump will, will suggest that. You want to add something? Yeah. Uh, just a, a couple of things. First off, summits are for two things. Uh, they are points in time when you record a decision, but that decision is already prepared in advance. And they are an opportunity for the leaders to talk to each other. And in this case, there are a couple things that have been prepared in advance, some of them the momentum from the previous administration, the Wales Summit, and some of them new impetus. And I would say that's on defense spending. I would say that's on counterterrorism. Um, and uh, it, it will probably result in a decision that NATO will become a part of the coalition against ISIS, and it will result in a tasking to NATO authorities to do follow-up work on what more should we be doing on counterterrorism. And the talking to each other thing, that gets to Ambassador Negroponte's question. Uh, President Trump has had a chance to meet a couple of the NATO leaders thus far, not the majority. And a lot of them are going to have their own questions about him, and they're going to want to make their own judgment. What do I think about this? Uh, so there will be an opportunity for him to present himself and talk about the world that, as he sees it. This is the world we're living in. I just came from the middle. I just came from Saudi Arabia. We're going to fight ISIS. We're going to counter violent extremism. We have to eradicate terrorism. Just came from Israel. We're pushing for an Israeli-Palestinian peace. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of things that we have to do, and I want you guys to take this seriously, and I want you to do it with me. Uh, I think that's the way he's going to approach it. And I think he's going to get a fairly favorable response uh, to, to, Jacob, to Jacob's question. I, I think um, European governments, uh, well, let me, let me say that there are four different factors. There is the public revulsion against Donald Trump you know, 99 percent uh, incontrovertible. Um, <laughs> there is the um, 
question about policy where governments are looking at this and saying, well, you know, on policy, we actually are pretty happy with what we've seen thus far. Uh, then there is the question of the government relationships, where those who have started to build a relationship with the administration are pretty happy as well. I've had, when we were in Germany, I took a, a time out to go to the chancellery and certainly heard that. And then the final thing is, what do people make about that as judgments about democracy? I think that's a different category. They don't necessarily like Trump, but that doesn't mean they don't, that therefore they also don't like democracy or they don't think American democracy is good. They just don't like the output to offer to the policies from it. Um, <laughs> so that's where I think we are. I think the sum is actually going to come away looking um, like it was a, a coming together of people for a first time. It's going to result in a couple of uh, touchstone decisions, as most summits do, and a tasking for work to be done, whether, as Sandy says, two years down the road or maybe one year down the road. Ambassador, you had a question Thank or a comment. Much. Ambassador Negroponte, I have a question, but I have a comment first, if you allow me. Uh, coming from a, an Atlantic country, of course, I have my own perceptions. And let me uh, make a point that I think it's, it's very important. Um, one thing is to have a discussion, a family discussion, let's call it that way, and when we discuss about NATO, we see it as a family discussion. And it's perfectly uh, normal to accept that I do not agree with my cousins every day, but I'm still my cousins, and we are still a family. And so, in a sense, I think it's very important to define very clearly what is, what, what is circumstantial, and what is essential. And frankly speaking, to see uh, the uh, relationship between Europe and the United States compared to the relationship between Europe and Russia and whatever is something that strikes me, to say the least. We are allies, full stop. And I have Portuguese citizens, soldiers, fighting together within NATO with American soldiers and dying for NATO overflying the Baltic countries and risking their lives. And this is because we have Article 5 and we are a family. So I think that it's very, very important to have this in mind when we discuss our differences, and they are just natural and normal. We all have differences. What is important that for me is the sense of purpose. Is it lost? Is it not lost? I would say that every time we see the United States, between commas, withdrawing, it becomes less evident, of course, for us all. And nobody is forcing the United States to be a member of NATO or to be in Asia or to be everywhere. That's an option. And our reading is that the United States decided to be present everywhere, and it's good for the world. This is very good for the world because it's in the interest of the United States as well, as the superpower it is. And we are very happy with that because we are part of the family, we are allies, and we share the same values. This sense of purpose, and I come to my, to my question. Um, Russia, and I will turn to Paul Saunders. I like very much what you said about Russia and the um, but to sum up, in a way, you said that the status quo that we have is the perfect status quo for Russia. So what's the point in changing it? What are the terms of the trade-off, in your opinion? Then my second point is on family issues. Um, what are we going to do with defense in Europe? Are we going to have a different and this is my, my question for Dagman. What's your view about that? Your perception from your side is that Europe is destined to have a security and defense structure that is parallel to NATO? Because to be very frank, well, but I, this is the Portuguese speaking again. Every time we had any attempts in Europe to build a European defense structure, you had the United States saying, no, 
no, no duplication. We have NATO, and we saying, yes, you are right. And we will never be for that, because we think we need not to duplicate, but to be complementary and to have you with us. So um, is there a different perception now from the United States? Are you ready to accept a European defense structure, uh, autonomous from NATO? That's so, sorry, Good. two no, questions. questions. And I, OK. Thank you. OK. All right. Well. Uh, it's a big question, but I'll try to answer it very briefly because it's a big group and there are four of us and others may have their own uh, views. Um, I, I, I think that I, I wouldn't say that the status quo is necessarily that desirable for Russia. I, I think the, the problem that the Russian government faces is there's not an easy way to get off of the status quo. Uh, but, but all else being equal, I think the Russian government would prefer uh, a world in which they're not facing uh, at least the uh, non-Crimea sanctions. You know, the Crimea sanctions, I think, are, are here to stay. But I, I think they'd prefer a world in which they're not facing the other sanctions, where they have access to American and European capital and technology where they're not uh, dependent on uh, China for capital and, and for other things. Uh, I, I, I think that's quite clear. Uh, and certainly as I look uh, myself at, at what's happened over the last 20 years, uh, I see uh, several failed efforts uh, by the Russians to be uh, part of the West, but part of the West in a way that reflects their own interests and their priorities and their culture and their pride and you know all, all kinds of other things. Uh, uh, and uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, it has not worked out. It may be the case that it will never work out. I, you know, I, 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 I honestly don't know, but uh, I, I, I think they have been trying over and over again in their in their own particular way, you know, which maybe it's not the way that we would try if we were in their shoes, but they are who they are. Uh, now, uh, as far as uh, uh, what the trade-off is, uh, you know, and how, how do you resolve this situation in Ukraine, you know, I mean, I think the basic parameters of what is in the Minsk agreement are, you know, more or less ap appropriate. Uh, th there are some things y you need to do to sequence it and get it to work right. Uh, but there is this huge question of Ukraine's membership in NATO, uh, which I think for the Russian government is just a non-negotiable violation of their perspective on their vital national interests. And uh, I, I think that is what it is. And we, we've got a uh, NATO declaration at the 2008 uh, Bucharest uh, summit uh, that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. And, you know, that uh, uh, receded in importance in 2010 because there was a Ukrainian government that wasn't making it a priority uh, to, to pursue that. Uh, now, uh, uh, obviously, uh, 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 we have a different government uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and I think the Russians are kind of looking forward to that question and it's a, a, a problem for them. Now. We have this uh, open door policy uh, of, of NATO, which has been the policy of the alliance from the, the very uh, beginning. Kind of anybody who wants to join NATO uh, can join NATO. Can apply. Can apply. Well, right. Can apply to join. Can apply to join. <laughs> no, but but uh, uh, certainly there there's a clear expectation that if they apply and they meet all of the criteria and uh, as an alliance we have been 
making the criteria more and more demanding to try to create uh, leverage uh, over aspiring members to get them to do things that we want them to do. Uh, but at the same time, th there's a perception uh, uh, that it, it, it's basically uh, an open door. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, has there been anyone who exercised their right to apply, you know, who was turned down? Yes. Uh, uh, there, there are some that have been kind of slower or faster. There are some that haven't happened. I mean, clearly Georgia and Ukraine haven't happened yet, but there was a decision that it would happen, or at least a declaration that it would happen. Uh, but uh, uh, th so th th this is kind of uh, a, a, a question I think that we have to confront. Now, I, I happen to think that if one got really creative and if there were a, uh, 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 a, a way uh, to get the Ukrainian government on board, I think there are creative ways to deal with a problem like this that preserves uh, Ukraine's uh, right to decide whether or not it wants to apply and preserves NATO's right to decide whether or not it wants Ukraine as a member and preserves uh, Russia's uh, 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 right to feel that its uh, interests have been taken into account. I guess I'll, I'll put it that way. That's not the most felicitous uh, formulation. Uh, but if you had a procedure under the Ukrainian constitution that required referenda in regions of Ukraine and a certain number of them had to approve it in order to join a military alliance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if the Ukrainian government would be interested in something like that. I tend to doubt it, but I, I think that would probably satisfy everybody else. Uh, but the, the, this question of uh, Ukraine's NATO membership, I think, is the central question. And that's the one where we need to engage in some searching self-reflection, uh, to my mind. I think we got it. In sorry, and sorry time. to give such a long answer. Yeah. I apologize. Um, does anybody want to comment on that? Because I, I have some doubt in my mind that it's central. I think you could also just finesse it. What well, do you think? I, I think there's two issues. One of them is the principle, and then the other is the practice of what we do day to day. The principle, I completely disagree with what Paul said. I think every country has a right to be secure in its own borders. NATO is a defensive alliance. There's nothing provocative about a country being safe in its own borders. And um, that we should stand by that unequivocally, whether it's Georgia or Ukraine or Macedonia or whomever. Uh, practical matter is, yes, some countries have sought membership and not gotten it, such as Macedonia. Um, Israel once talked about it and was basically told, you're not really European and we're not going to go with that. Um, <laughs> you know, they're in the we are. Yes, right. Right. Um, and um, that at the same time, I think when we would look at Ukraine or Georgia today, there, there is not a country in the alliance, including the United States, that would say, gee, they're ready to be a NATO member today. Mm -hmm. So I think as a matter of practice, this is not a central issue and not one that's on the table right now. But we should be unequivocal about it is normal for countries to be secure in their own borders and to be able to defend them and it's not threatening to anybody. Can, can I respond to that very, yeah, sure. very, very briefly? Uh, everybody has a right to be safe. The problem is we have something called a security dilemma. And if uh, uh, one side interprets its right to be safe in a way that makes another side feel threatened, then rights become much less important than actual responses. Uh, and I think that's uh, the, the situation that we've gotten into. I would say I, I agree with Kurt's basic frame of the issue, but I, I don't think Ukraine's uh, future relationship with NATO is the central issue today. I mean, the central issue today is Russia's claim of a right to flagrantly violate the sovereignty of its neighbors, to occupy parts of their territory, to wage an illegal undeclared war, as they're doing in the Donbass, continue to occupy Georgia, Moldova. Uh, I think this is where I would agree with Paul's opening remarks, that the litmus test that Trump should put to Russia 
hopefully with full allied backing, this is something that if not at the meeting on Thursday, but going forward, could become a combined U.S.-European strategy uh, to try to get the Russians to get out of the Donbass. If you get them to agree to implement the Minsk agreements, we will have to probably invent some new enforcement mechanisms which are missing from Minsk. Uh, but, you know, hold out the prospect of a better relationship between the West and Moscow if Russia at least returns to this dimension of compliance with the Helsinki rules, uh, restores Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, it may take a couple of years of transition, but to get the uh, illegal militias disarmed and restore Ukrainian sovereignty over the Donbass, that would create a huge uh, new opening to begin to rebuild the rest of the uh, relationship with Russia. Uh, maybe it, the question of NATO will come up in those discussions, but I'd like to get to the fundamental issue, which I see as violations of sovereignty first, uh, and to get the U.S. and Europe to put together a package of carrots and sticks. The carrots could be a kind of a phase sanctions relief if they, if they perform under Minsk. The stick would be uh, a readiness to provide additional weapons to Ukraine to, to deter further Russian aggression if, if diplomacy is rejected, rejected by, by Putin. Uh, that's where I think the U.S. and Europe could, could join forces in something that would be good for Europe and good for the U.S. So there was a second question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, let me just say, no. on, the, uh, on the other, the countries have a right to seek security. It doesn't mean the U.S. has an obligation right. to satisfy their desires. And ultimately, America's first responsibility is its own defense. I think you raise a very important issue. The, the reality is that U.S. policy has always been that other countries should do more, but only under America's direction. I think there are a few things that more horrify American policymakers than the thoughts of allies with independent capabilities willing to independently <laughs> exercise those capabilities, and I think that applies to Asia as well as Europe. Right? Kind of a horrifying thought indeed that one's allies have independent action on their mind. Uh, and I think that remains it largely... It gives more importance to the commentaries we make at meetings such uh, as Absolutely. This. I'm part of that. I mean, I, I, I believe in that very much. Uh, and I think if you looked at the presidential candidates in 2016, other than Donald Trump and perhaps Rand Paul and perhaps somebody else floating around in there, whether Democrat or Republican, that in fact they would have generally shared you know, that viewpoint. I do think it's not quite so clear what the president believes. And I'm not sure if the president knows what he believes. I mean, again, every other week there's a new pronouncement of whether or not he wants to meet whatever dictator and would be honored to do so, and then his aides explain what he really meant, and then the next week he comes up with something else. So I think that it is an open question uh, you know, on Europe and Asia to some degree. And I think that the public itself is less enamored of a policy that would seem to say, please don't do more and, and do your own thing. We want to do it for you. And I think especially budget issues will press that more on future administrations. But the reality is, as you do budgets, it's going to be much harder to, because if you want commitments, you have to have force structure. Force structure is expensive. How are you going to underwrite that? I would like to see you know, a change in that policy and a recognition that, in fact, the U.S. is better off, even if allies have independent ideas and may not always share some of the same your viewpoints that far better to offload some of those responsibilities where in fact they are better able and have greater interest at stake than to expect the United States to take the leading role in every one of those almost irrespective of region. I would add that the last two administrations haven't actually been that hostile to uh, Europe doing yeah, more through, through the European Union's common security and defense policy having you know, an EU option to do missions in northern Africa so that the U.S. and NATO don't have to do it uh, I think has been something that's been welcomed. And though more of that would be uh, sort of another way to show that Europe is still worth depending on against the big threats because they're doing more to handle those crises that they can handle by themselves. So it's not that we've necessarily run out of time, but, but I have. Because uh, <laughs> I've got to go up to a hearing uh, at the Senate where I'm one of the witnesses uh, at 2.30 this afternoon. So I want to thank uh, the panelists for their participation this afternoon and, and all of you for your questions and thank you again to the Center for organizing what I think was a very important discussion before the upcoming meeting of the President with, uh, with NATO. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you.